If I had to pick a scene that represented why I have so many conflicting opinions about Death Stranding, I'd pick this scene near the very end. After reconnecting the United States, defeating Higgs, cutting off Amelie, and delaying humanity's extinction, Sam meets a bitterly ironic fate, to live out eternity stuck in a purgatory between life and death, a sacrifice that gives humanity a new lease on life. It's a selfless decision that thematically makes a lot of sense. When the game starts, Sam is apathetic, resentful, and uninterested in helping rebuild America from the apocalyptic destruction of the Death Stranding. But by the end, Sam's arc bends the other way. Over the course of his journey, Sam meets other people, people whose lives, like his, were upended by the Death Stranding. Hartman, Fragile, Deadman, Mama, and Lachna, each with their own personal quests intertwined with the Death Stranding. In meeting and forging connections with these characters, and with all the survivors who hadn't given up hope, Sam's faith in the human spirit is restored. So as Low Roar's I'll Keep Coming accompanies the final credits, the ending is sad, but also appropriate. Where he was once apathetic, Sam becomes selfless, trading an eternity of solitude for humanity's and his friend's continued existence. But after the credits roll, something happens. Amelie says this, Listen, Sam. I was the one that brought you and Cliff together again. There was something I wanted you to know. You were never abandoned, and you're not alone. Don't you see, Sam? You have to live. And Sam is rescued from eternity, resurrected back into the real world. So why does Amelie tell Sam he has to live? I agonized at the answer to that question, at the meaning behind Sam's resurrection, but in the scenes that followed, Death Stranding seemed more concerned with how Sam's rescue happened rather than why it was important. In the end, this is what led us to you. Just when we were about to give up, Die Hardman reminded us about the revolver. So we tried to follow it and it led us to a far corner of your own beach. And bingo, there you were. Mama made visual contact first. She was able to see you from her vantage point on the other side. She informed Lachna via their connection, and Hartman confirmed your location during his subsequent NDE. The plan was for Fragile to, in essence, slingshot Lou and me to your position so we could rescue you. That paragraph of dialogue has caused me a lot of confusion, and a lot of reflection. It does serve an explicit purpose, explaining exactly how Deadman, Hartman, Fragile, Mama, and Lachna were able to save Sam from an eternity alone. But the more important question, the why, is buried under Death Stranding's dialogue having to explain itself within the confines of its own fiction. Death Stranding has a lot to say, and it isn't afraid of saying it. In this metaphysical universe, symbolism and heavy-handed dialogue take center stage, and be it about political divisions in the US to civil liberties or even automation, Death Stranding is going to talk, and it wants you to listen. For fans of Hideo Kojima, this isn't new. The famed game developer is credited for writing, directing, and designing much of the Metal Gear Solid series, which, over the course of seven mainline entries, touched on denuclearization, child soldiers, digital misinformation, and even used a not-so-subtle mock-up of Guantanamo Bay for the setting of Metal Gear Solid V Ground Zeroes. As a series, Metal Gear Solid is long-winded and preachy. Its characters, history, and lore are hopelessly intertwined, tangled by changing loyalties, double and triple agents and secret societies that stretch over a half decade worth of backstory. Its plot centering on characters searching and fighting for a better humanity, Metal Gear Solid reached profound heights, as well as some pretty stark lows. So after more than 10 years dealing with a series whose plot characters and lore are just all over the place, Death Stranding picks up right where Metal Gear Solid left off, asking us to consider humanity not only from a human perspective, but a cosmic perspective too. The impetus here, both metaphorical metaphorical and mechanical, is Unity. It's a game about rebuilding the United States from near total destruction and reconnecting the severed ties that once bound it and the rest of human civilization together. For a AAA title that follows the legacy of Metal Gear Solid, Death Stranding is unconventional and takes enormous risks. It's often inconvenient, cumbersome, and dull, 
but it's also meaningful, introspective, and beautifully detailed. Transporting is the majority of what you'll do in Death Stranding, delivering cargo from one point to another, braving the elements and avoiding both paranormal and human enemies. Combat is not a main avenue of play in Death Stranding, although it is an option. Death Stranding's open world is unique. It's a quieter, much more passive map than your standard AAA open world. You won't be ambushed by enemies or need to worry about roaming monsters and heaps of checklist goodies. Enemies are confined to their own territories. It's often you who chooses when and how to interact with them, if at all. What you are fighting in Death Stranding is fatigue and logistics. America's material reconstruction enables its communal reconstruction, and you're handling both. From building roads to placing ladders, you reshape the land while hauling much-needed cargo from shelter to shelter, knotting humanity's loose ends back together. This reshaping is even partially literal. Walking the same paths over time flattens and smooths the ground. You won't be doing all this construction by yourself, though. The map is populated by other player structures, usually placed in such a way that it helps you piece the world together, as though it's a giant, incomplete puzzle, and it's up to you to decide how to finish it. The contrast between a disconnected and empty map and one reconnected and full of buildings and roads is a constant reminder that you aren't alone. A world that initially appears lonesome becomes collaborative. The names of players that came before you are attached to their buildings. Since Sending and receiving likes feels as though you're giving other players digital high fives, encouraging one another to rebuild the country. The humanity portrayed in Death Stranding is drawing its final breaths, and it's up to you to reverse that, to overcome isolation with wit, ingenuity, and a willingness to cooperate. That's how Death Stranding works conceptually. You bring people together, together, overcoming dangers through pseudo-co-op gameplay that's working on metaphorical and practical levels. Where co-op stands on its own as an exercise in unity, dissecting what Death Stranding wants to say on broader items is difficult, partially because it suffers from many of the same issues that plagued Metal Gear Solid. Wordy cinematics and characters with long and complex backstories, and a world with a long and complex backstory, overshadow its primary message of forging connections and uniting humanity. Dialogue is packed with exposition. Sizable chunks of Death Stranding's runtime are spent explaining its universe rather than exploring the heavy themes it brings to the table. This is frustrating, especially when you're trying to understand its world and distinguish what elements are metaphorical and which are literal. Death Stranding's attempts to unpack and explain its own paranormal science fiction universe grind against its search for meaning, like two gears rotating opposite directions. And this narrative complexity is only compounded on by irregular gameplay, itself oscillating between dull and dynamic. Set in the near future, the United States has been decimated by the Death Stranding, an explosive paranormal apocalypse. Contact with the outside world severed, what's left is a smattering of sheltered survivors, some isolated, others surviving as members of the United Cities of America, the remnants of the United States former government. The Death Stranding has merged the worlds of the living and dead. Due to this merger, when a person dies, their soul is unable to transition to the afterlife, and instead returns to the physical world where it's likely to become a BT. Beached things, or BTs, are mysterious, ill-defined entities that, when in contact with humans, trigger void outs, massive explosions that annihilate large swaths of surrounding land. Before the Death Stranding, after a person died, their soul would travel to the beach, an interim realm between life and the afterlife where time doesn't exist. Every person with a soul has their own beach, manifested from their individual beliefs, almost as though beaches are post-mortem representations of the self. With the Death Stranding slowly strangling humanity through BTs and voidouts, Sam is tasked by Bridges, a division of the UCA, to journey across the US, make contact with shelters, and connect them to the UCA's chiral network, a super-powered internet that uses the beach to transmit data. Once reconnected through the chiral network, the United States can facilitate its reconstruction, building itself as a nation and reconnecting as a people. This is Death Stranding's narrative and mechanical foundation, resulting in a relatively consistent pattern that persists throughout most of the game. You get a job to transport cargo somewhere, make the trip, deliver the cargo, and connect the survivor to the chiral network. Infrastructure can only be built in areas connected to the chiral network, meaning Sam can only use the tools he carries, like ladders and ropes, while traversing unconnected territory. But once you've found and connected 
settlements, you'll see other player structures and be able to add your own. Until then, though, larger buildable structures like roads, bridges, and safe houses aren't available. As for Sam himself, he's about as layered a video game character as they come. Sam has multiple status meters, including stamina, endurance, a battery level, and even a meter that shows the condition of his boots. The baby strapped to Sam's chest, Louise, has her own stress meter as well. Depending on multiple factors, including how much weight you carry or strenuous activity you do, like sprinting or crossing rivers, Sam's meters degrade at different paces. Sam's maximum weight capacity and center of gravity, too, impact how well he controls. If Sam's carrying a heavy amount of cargo, sprinting, climbing, or walking up steep hills depletes his stamina more quickly. He'll also have trouble keeping balance, which you'll need to manage by having him brace his arms. Without much cargo, Sam controls like your average third-person character. He's responsive and precise. Give him enough weight and his athleticism goes to the wayside. Now it feels like you're controlling a horse or tank. His momentum makes him harder to turn and position, and he's more liable to slip on rough or steep terrain. Sam's inherent abilities upgrade as you complete deliveries, but his best enhancements come with equipment. Blood bags, for instance, refill Sam's blood after he's taken damage, effectively extending his health. Wearables like the all-terrain legs make it easier for Sam to walk on uneven terrain. While equipment like this does provide you with a few playstyle choices, what Sam's wearing or using will likely depend more on your given situation. The all-terrain legs specifically are so effective that by not using them, you'd likely be putting yourself at a disadvantage. No matter how you play, Sam is a depreciating asset, and so is his cargo and equipment. The longer you stay out, the more equipment you'll use and the more all Sam's meters degrade. Fatigue slowly eats away at stamina. There are ways to mitigate fatigue while out in the field, like walking easier, flatter routes or using a ladder to scale a hill rather than climb it. Letting Sam rest will partially restore his stamina, as will drinking from his canteen, though you'll need to find a water source to refill it. Likewise, equipment can't be repaired, refilled, or reloaded. Cargo containers can be repaired, but damage done directly to cargo will stay. Some items, like weapons, are inseparable from their own carrying case, meaning once they're empty, you'll just be carrying an empty box. All this survival and equipment management necessitates shelters and private rooms, where Death Stranding funnels much of its gameplay. Shelters are way stations, knots that provide the means to connect other shelters and form a strand across the US. Even if they're awkward to say and even more difficult to remember, Distribution Center west of Capital Knot City doesn't exactly spur the mind like Whiterun or Novigrad. Once a shelter's connected to the chiral network, you can accept orders, fabricate new equipment, and store and retrieve building material. That box holding an empty gun, you can recycle it, reverting it into raw material that's used to fabricate other equipment or build structures. Broadly speaking, that's how Death Stranding's gameplay is organized. You make deliveries, reconnect the US-1 shelter at a time, and periodically return to private rooms to rest and resupply. When at its best, Death Stranding is a game of measured risks and proper planning. Delivering cargo without the right tools can slow you down and make trips more difficult, meaning longer routes, more pit stops, and perhaps damage to important cargo. Carefully plotting your routes goes a long way, not only saving you time, but avoiding threats, too. There's an immense feeling of satisfaction from being prepared. When you draw a route, estimate what you'll need to make the trip, and end up using the equipment you brought along. It's a dynamic system that rewards foresight, efficiency, and resourcefulness. And after a few hours, you're challenging yourself with how much cargo you can carry or how efficient and fast you can make your routes. Unfortunately, Death Stranding is also somewhat forgiving on this end. Chance upon a giant canyon? Just make your way around it. Need to climb a hill but forgot a ladder? There's probably a couple ways to climb it. Your experience in Death Stranding is tied pretty strongly to where on the map you happen to walk, and this means that satisfying sense of preparedness, your attention to detail, is occasionally distilled to an overcompensation. Even with all of Sam's status meters, the way he moves and managing his inventory, Death Stranding really isn't all that difficult and in some ways, that's disappointing. For each delivery, you get a rating, decided by, among other things, how much damage the cargo took and how much the total delivery weighed. What's important is that you deliver your cargo in the best possible shape without it getting seriously damaged or lost. Some deliveries have timers, others include fragile cargo or boxes you can't submerge underwater. There's even a premium delivery option, which will add requirements and make deliveries more difficult. But these prerequisites often aren't that tough to overcome, especially if you're playing online. I played 
through the game twice, once offline where, for the most part, I was on my own, unable to see or use structures made by other players, and once online where I could see other players' structures, assist in their construction, and complete deliveries for other players. In all that time, my deliveries were rarely graded below an S, the highest grade. Death Stranding's difficulty in this respect is a double-edged sword. On one hand, easier deliveries lead to better grades, which increase your reputation with shelters, which unlocks better equipment and a higher porter grade. On the other hand, by not providing tougher, more complex deliveries, and with as forgiving as the map can be, infrastructure that takes time to build, like roads, zip lines, and safe houses, become more convenient than they are necessary. Death Stranding is designed to be played with the help of others, but you can get through it alone and do just fine. Playing offline may be a bit more difficult, but it's also more challenging and fulfilling. As an example, all vehicles run on solar-powered batteries. If the battery runs out, you'll have to abandon the vehicle and let the battery recharge, which takes a while. When I played by myself, the vehicles that existed were only the ones I made, which meant there were fewer to use. Losing one was more punishing. While driving, I had to be more aware of my battery, where the closest shelters were, and build generators, which recharge batteries in specific spots. This resulted in small, organic networks of generators that bridged gaps in between shelters created by me. It was a satisfying self-sufficiency, the potency of which was lessened by playing online. Once online, generators and vehicles were everywhere. I didn't really have to worry about creating my own system. The puzzle was being solved for me by other players. Gameplay does become a little more dynamic online. With all these structures around, you have more options on how to complete deliveries. Shelters have shared lockers that you can donate or take from, and garages are almost always stocked with extra vehicles for you to take at your leisure. You'll still have to do some heavy lifting, especially in my experience with regards to roads and zip lines, other player structures make getting around easier, but it's often up to you to put the final pieces in place. With shared resources and additional structures, the world is safer to travel, and avoiding enemy territory is much easier than when playing on your own. If Death Stranding's world were more aggressive, playing alone would probably be a lot harder, and its co-op far more integral. Instead, the world is passive, allowing you to impose on it the pace and style of your deliveries. Considering the focus Death Stranding puts on on cargo, this makes sense. Enemies in the open world are obstacles like any other mountain or cliff. Obstacles whose worst consequences affect Sam's cargo and delivery time more than Sam himself. Even death, which is generally associated with a fail state in games, is treated closer to a deterrent than a failure. Sam is a repatriate, a person whose soul can return to life after death. When he dies, Sam's soul enters the seam, a realm between life and the beach, where it can re enter his physical body and bring Sam back to life. This means Sam can die in a fight, resurrect through the seam, and come right back as though nothing happened. No matter how bad a beating Sam takes, game overs, for the most part, are tied to the status of mission critical cargo. Appropriately, threats across Death Stranding's world seem to be designed around this premise too. They're meant to slow Sam down and harass his cargo, rather than be challenging combat opponents. The most common of these threats is Timefall, rain that quickly ages anything Thing it touches. Walk into a storm and timefall erodes at your equipment and cargo containers, ruining them if exposed long enough. When it comes to active threats like BTs and humans, their territory is defined. Orange areas on Sam's map mark the territory of human enemies, so you'll need to find them first. BT territory won't show up on your map. Instead, it's marked by gorgeous and haunting upside down rainbows and strands that jet into the sky, all of which you can spot from miles away. BTs are accompanied by perpetual timefall, and as you approach, the sky darkens and timefall intensifies. With conscious enemies, Death Stranding's emphasis on cargo remains. Besides the occasional mission that sends you into enemy territory, the real challenge is getting your cargo through or around enemies safely, rather than defeating the enemies themselves. Combat is definitely an option, and enemy territory often holds plenty of good resources too, but fighting risks damaging or losing cargo. Low-level weapons are noticeably unwieldy and wild, and of course, once a weapon is out of ammo, it's out. The safest bet for your cargo is to stay quiet and sneak by. Navigating BTs is like moving through a paranormal minefield. Sam can't see BTs directly other than brief glimpses, so it's up to his Odrodek to guide him, which points in the direction of the nearest BT. Keeping quiet and moving slowly usually slips you past them just fine, but the heavy timefall means you can't take too much time lest your cargo takes damage. In the event that
that BTs capture you, Tar seeps up from the ground and BTs grasp at Sam, slowing him from escaping. If overwhelmed, Sam falls to the ground and is dragged to a giant BT. Giant BTs are essentially optional mini boss fights. The tar spreads from a puddle to a sea of buildings and debris, rising and sinking from the ground. And as mesmerizing as it is to watch the tar wave and buildings rise and fall, it is a slog to run through. Sam is slow, the giant BT follows you and may attack, and every hit means something may be knocked off you and damaged. If you escape from the area or kill it, the giant and its surrounding BTs drain away, making the land temporarily safe to cross, which you may need to retrieve lost cargo. If the giant manages to capture and eat Sam, it causes a mini void out. Sam still comes back to life, but the void out destroys any structures you had in the area and creates a long lasting crater you'll have to go around to get past. For human enemies, Death Stranding morphs much closer to standard third person stealth action. You sneak through tall grass, creep up behind bad guys to subdue them, and mark enemies with Sam's Odru deck, which tracks any cargo they're carrying. With that blueprint in place, Death Stranding also deviates away from standard stealth action in a few key ways. Enemies have extremely long sight lines, and not just relative to stealth games, but games in general. They patrol all over their territory, on foot and in vehicles, they'll notice fallen comrades, and if one spots you, chances are the rest of the outpost will know your location within a couple of seconds. Like with BTs, open combat is an option against humans too, but where the price of combat against BTs is a big clumsy boss fight, fighting humans is more streamlined, but still comes with its caveats. If Sam is knocked unconscious or killed, he'll still be revived, but his cargo is looted and body dumped outside enemy territory. Whatever Sam loses can be taken back, you'll just have to sneak or fight through their base to get it. Like giant BTs, knocking human enemies unconscious makes the area temporarily safe to travel. Outright killing them does the same, but where Sam's soul can return to his body through repatriation, enemy souls can't. If you kill an enemy and leave their corpse alone, it'll eventually spawn a BT and give you a game over. This means killing human enemies should be saved as a last resort. Not only does it upset and stress out Louise, but to avoid the game over, you'll have to deliver each corpse to an incinerator, of which there are only a few spread out across the world. Luckily, Sam has plenty of non-lethal options to take care of bad guys, including non-lethal guns that work and feel exactly the same as lethal guns, just with different paint jobs. Sam's bola gun wraps around humans and BTs, immobilizing them and stopping them from alerting others of your presence, though you'll have to give human enemies a kick to knock them out for good. For a game that makes combat secondary to its experience, you'll actually unlock quite a few weapons, but also items like stun grenades and fake cargo containers that distract or incapacitate enemies. With Sam's cord cutters, you can sneak up on BTs and cut their ghostly umbilical cords, ridding them of their connection to the physical world and sending them to the land of the dead. They'll even give you a like for doing so. So. Death Stranding's aversion to outright killing enemies, even if cheekily brushed aside with non-lethal weapons, is part of a larger, empathetic world that I don't think is all that obvious from the beginning. Mules, who initially appear as regular bandits, suffer from delivery dependence syndrome, an addiction to delivering goods. They've been consumed by a disease. It's why, if Sam doesn't have any cargo, mules won't attack him. The homo demons, Sam's other human enemies, are extremists whose desire to stay out of the UCA has led them to terrorism. At least that's how they're introduced. Homo demons, militant separatist group. They run Edge Knot City. I've heard of them. Bunch of terrorists who go around towns killing people and leaving craters. Of course, read about chiral contamination and things become cloudy. Chirelium is everywhere in Death Stranding. It's a mysterious, sometimes toxic substance that comes from the beach, powers the chiral network, and appears in physical form through timefall and chiral crystals. Prolonged exposure results in hormonal imbalances in the brain, which leads to heightened destructive impulses towards the self and others. So are mules and homo demons conscious of their actions, or are they victims? Even BT are described as reaching out to bridge the gap between life and death, as though they're lost and confused, but not malicious. There's a new uneasy perspective granted by seeing Death Stranding's world this way, a world where you're unsure if enemies are aware of their actions, or if BTs are monsters or just lost souls desperately clinging to life. 
Death Stranding takes a lot of risks, but within these risks is meaning. It largely abides by the boundaries set by its narrative, its gameplay reinforcing a story of connections and togetherness. But it's also hard to ignore the design that doesn't feel necessary. Its slew of menus, the numerous mini cutscenes you'll mash buttons to skip, the mess that is combating giant BTs and cluttered chaotic seas of tar is also recreated in some progression tied boss fights too. Where in the open world you can rationalize their inconvenience as threats to Sam's cargo, in the context of progression, that same justification is tough to maintain. And then there's sweet, innocent little Louise. It's Louise, technically speaking, that detects BTs. She's a bridge baby, a near fully formed fetus with a strong connection to both the worlds of the living and dead. She sees BTs and the Odredek points at them. If Louise gets too stressed out, she'll go into a coma, meaning your Odredek won't be able to detect BTs until you've gone back to her private room and rested. Keeping her healthy sounds more intrusive than it actually is. Outside killing enemies, Louise's stress level doesn't rise all that quickly, and if need be, you can always rock her pod back and forth to calm her down if you're out in the field. What is intrusive about Louise is that when Sam takes a tumble or enters combat with a giant BT, she gets scared and cries. <laughs> Louise's crying doesn't serve any mechanical function, her stress meter still degrades at a normal pace, crying or not, but it does humanize her, and it's only a part of how she reacts to the world around her. She also giggles when Sam travels at high speeds, and cheers when you safely escape enemy territory. Even with that being the case, a screaming baby doesn't exactly make an exciting introduction to a boss fight, and calming Louise down becomes a chore. An action once done out of care and concern, after a few hours, is done done just to stop an audio file, and maybe that's the point. While Death Stranding doesn't let you mute Louise in-game, you can switch her voice to emit from the DualShock 4 speaker and turn the speaker itself down, effectively muting her, that is if you're playing on the PS4. This takes the good with the bad though, and maybe that's the point too. Part of Death Stranding's ethos, and marketing, is the idea that the game, its asynchronous co-op where everyone's contributing and working together, constitutes a new genre. It even says as much on the back of the box. And as self assured as it may seem to lay claim to a whole new genre, the irregularities of Death Stranding's design, as well as its commitment to those irregularities, lend that claim some weight. If Death Stranding does represent a new genre, that genre's definition may include narrative elements as well as mechanical, because Death Stranding's eccentric design doesn't exist in a vacuum. Instead, it's reinforced by a plot that's just as eccentric, and takes just as many risks. So what exactly is Death Stranding about? Well, it's about a lot of stuff. It's a commentary on political divisions in the United States, but also wants to say something about humanity at large. It's character-driven, spending a lot of time telling us who its characters are and how the Death Stranding changed their lives, but it also wants to tell us how this paranormal universe works, and does so to a meticulous degree. It constantly breaks the fourth wall, both during dialogue and when characters talk directly into the screen at the player. If you ever wonder how certain characters got their name, they might just tell you. Amelie. Am um, is French for soul. A soul that's a lie. I never had a birthday. I'm a soulless meat puppet. No car. A dead man. Narratively, there is a lot going on, and the extremes Death Stranding reaches with its narrative are, well, extreme. Cinematics are often self-indulgent and overstay their welcome, sometimes they're even unintentionally hilarious, like watching Sam and Amelie share a tender moment while Sam grins through a face covered in blood, or when Sam's getting a speech about humanity and togetherness while nauseating product placement gobbles up a fourth of the foreground. Other times, the cinematography and emotion in these shots is undeniably brilliant, even if Sam's dull, bright white private room is a constant setting. The opening ambush on Sam specifically is a phenomenal, terrifying tracking shot that shows a selfless sacrifice gone wrong as Igor is unable to kill himself before triggering a void out. 
In this and other scenes, there's foreshadowing and subtle details you'll almost certainly miss during your first viewing. As creative as these cutscenes get, it's frustrating then to watch Death Stranding's story unfold across a patchwork of exposition-laden dialogue and unlockable text blocks. There is a lot of information delegated to Sam's emails and interviews. Some of it's supplementary, and other portions, had it found its way into dialogue, I think could have made the world easier to understand and more thoughtful. Whether or not BTs, homo demons, or mules are conscious of their actions is really put into place by these optional readables, rather than being suggested in dialogue. I suspect that at least part of the reason why is because dialogue has so much work to do explaining the history of its characters, the history of its world, and how the world itself works. Across Death Stranding's narrative, metaphor and diegesis compete for screen time and script space, resulting in an awkward paradox where various pieces of this world are thoroughly fleshed out, some are left for you to read, and others are underwritten or ignored. Bridge Babies provide a decent example here. BB's ability to see BTs is enabled by a connection with the afterlife, itself facilitated by still mothers, brain dead women whose bodies are kept alive on life support. This whole dynamic feels closer to dystopian sci fi than a story about human perseverance, yet Death Stranding doesn't seem interested in unpacking the dubious ethics still mothers present. Is using someone's body as a tool? moral or ethical? Was there any sort of consent in becoming a still mother? These things aren't answered or really even discussed, which is irrelevant of what my or anyone's opinion is, disappointing considering the thought-provoking questions it asks. Speaking of BBs, are they people? Do they have a right to life? Dead Man is really the only character that addresses these concerns head on. At the beginning, he explains that BBs can't survive outside the pod, and after a short period, have to be disposed of like any other human body. It's because we're partners. Hmm. Partners? Sam, a baby's a tool, not a human being. Bridge, yes. Baby, no. Sam doesn't want to lose Louise, and Louise certainly seems alive, and as the two grow closer, you'd think this would become a bigger plot point. Death Stranding positions Deadman and Sam on opposite ends of those questions, but rather than exploring them, Deadman kinda just changes his mind, mostly off-screen, coming to the realization that BBs are people. How the rest of Bridges rationalizes BBs and still mothers, we don't get a good picture of. The Chiral Network was first established by Amelie when she traveled west for her own ill fated expedition before the events of the game. While not explained explicitly, BBs are worked directly into the network's architecture in such a way that it kills them, leading to one of Dead Man's more weighty lines. The truth is, Sam, BBs were originally conceived as catalysts for the operation of the chiral network. They're integrated into the infrastructure of not cities for that very reason. Every single one you've brought into the fold. It was probably Amelie herself who installed them as she moved west with the first expedition, carrying out her mother's grand plan, making sacrifice after sacrifice on the altar of progress. President Strand told the people what they wanted to hear and did what she thought had to be done. Also, America could be whole again, but I'm starting to wonder if it didn't cost her her soul. The Chiral Network is our greatest creation, our proudest achievement, and our guiltiest sin. To say pregnancy and abortion are recurring motifs in Death Stranding is an understatement. Sam carries a baby in an artificial womb, there's a debate over whether that baby is a person, and Amelie is said to have lost her soul due to sacrificing babies. Mama's whole subplot is about two women, and perhaps one woman, coming to terms with a failed pregnancy and conquering the ensuing mental and physical trauma. Outwardly, it's not difficult to piece together a pro-life message here. Sam breaks UCA law at the very end of the game, taking Louise out of her pod and resuscitating her, presumably going on to live happily ever after. But within this quote also resides a counterpoint of sorts, that the Chiral Network is humanity's greatest creation. It's what reconnects America and humanity, ultimately allowing Sam to stop the final death stranding. What appears to be a contradiction, the chiral network both ending and enabling life, I think is actually a thematic driving force. Sam is quiet and reserved, his body ravaged by hand-shaped bruises. And where through this torment we may find sympathy for Sam, Death Stranding goes further. Sam is stripped of much of his dignity, his physical well-being secondary to the condition of his cargo. Sam is a gig worker, literally handcuffed to a mobile device that records his conversations and tracks 
tracks his movements. His only interactions with people, for the most part, are digital, done through holograms and spacious automated distribution centers. Private rooms are private only in name, as other characters appear and disappear at will. Even his bodily fluids are siphoned, analyzed, and turned into anti-BT weapons. His perilous deliveries are reduced to letter grades that increase a star rating, which feels increasingly patronizing every time you give Sam a shower and watch his blood twirl down the drain. And of course, Death Stranding ends with Sam uncovering layer after layer of deceit. Firstly, that Amelie lied about being in need of rescue, the original motivation for Sam's trip west, and finally, that she is not totally human, but an extinction entity, a being whose purpose it is to usher in the next mass extinction. Yet, without Amelie's deception, Sam would not have reconnected the US and saved humanity from annihilation. Between Sam's mistreatment, the guiltiest sin of sacrificed babies and still mothers left on life support, we're forced to confront questions about how society has built itself, and not just in the context of the fictional UCA, but our very real world. When we consider the conditions games are made in, the process that leads to a box being delivered to your doorstep, or even how our entire world was constructed, and yet consume and benefit from the end product, we're left with the uncomfortable task of somehow reconciling all those things. In this regard, even Death Stranding struggles to find nuanced ground. In texts and cutscenes, Death Stranding is pretty critical of the United States. The game begins with Sam meeting President Strand before she dies of cancer. It's a president on life support with a strikingly familiar shadow. Somewhere along the line, people became so damned intolerant, one survivor writes, all of a sudden, there wasn't any room for other opinions, or other people for that matter. We even elected a guy right before the Death Stranding that wanted to build a wall along the whole border, stop anyone like me from coming in. How could I expect a goddamn thing from a country that didn't want me? How could I hope to get by in a land where the weak and needy got fucked over for profit and peace of mind? Death Stranding's criticisms of America are scattershot, and they may be better described as an overflow of frustration than a comprehensive critique of American life and politics. The problem here is that, while Death Stranding bemoans an America that's lost its way, it doesn't address how America itself came to be, similar to the question it wants us to ask ourselves about our everyday lives. It sees America through an idealistic lens, but doesn't acknowledge that not everyone will share that same framework, let alone it be idealistic. Unity and togetherness are noble pursuits, but these goals feel more like platitudes every time a character says Sam must make America whole again, but doesn't engage with the deeper discussion about what being whole means, or that, for some US citizens, America may not have ever been whole in the first place. In Death Stranding's defense, its narrative is more concerned with looking forward rather than discussing what America is or was, as the final chapter is titled, Tomorrow is in Your Hands. And it is the future Death Stranding focuses on, not just an immediate future, mind you, but future on a cosmic scale. Between Cliff and Higgs, Death Stranding has two quasi-villains with vast different characterizations and motivations, and each linked to Sam in different ways. So many of Death Stranding's characters are subdued and in conflict with their pasts. Fragile fights to restore her unjustly tarnished reputation. Hartman dedicates his life to searching for his lost family. By comparison, Higgs is theatrical and flamboyant. He even has a twisted sense of humor. Once unmasked, though, we see that his act is superficial. Higgs is tormented by cynicism. He doesn't see the point in extending humanity's life a few hundred thousand years, and thus acts on Amelie's behalf by leading the homo demons and instilling chaos and disorder across the UCA, his goal to help end humanity. Higgs is Sam's reflection in a funhouse mirror, and it's his cynicism that pits he and Sam against one another. In his journals, Higgs started out as a porter, much like Sam, and even believed in doing what he could to help humanity. But after he met Amelie, her power as an extinction entity seduced him, and he became fatalistic. Sam started as a cynic, a disbeliever in American Reconstruction, but progressed in the opposite direction. He eventually came to believe that humanity could be saved, even if his realization happens abruptly and late in the story. The quote by Japanese author Kobo Abe that Death Stranding begins with creates a metaphor for Higgs and Sam's feud, the rope as a tool that brings things together, and a stick as a weapon that keeps things away. This dynamic between Sam and Higgs comes full circle before their final confrontation. Just a good old-fashioned boss fight. Stick versus rope. Gun versus strand. 
And if Higgs embodies cynicism, Cliff embodies division. For much of the game, who Cliff is, where he comes from, and what his motivations are largely remain a mystery. Sam's flashbacks paint the picture of a loving, sometimes even silly father, but without the deeper personal insights that Higgs journals give us. What these flashbacks do create is a sharp contrast between the loving husband and father and the vengeful, confused revenant who returns to take back his son. Cliff's anger manifests in the only thing he knows, conflict. Beaches where the souls of those who died in war wage an eternal, never-ending battle. While each of Cliff's boss fights are visually spectacular and vary pretty heavily in terms of structure, I also think they fit Death Stranding's context better than some of the game's other action scenes, specifically Sam's hand-to-hand -hand fight with Higgs, which is drenched in melodrama. At the end of each fight, Sam approaches Cliff in an attempt to better understand him, and this pays off at the end. When the two make a connection, Cliff's memory returns and he realizes that Sam is his son, albeit in a somewhat sudden fashion. After he's defeated, Higgs paraphrases Shakespeare in one of his final journals. It's a reference to Macbeth's soliloquy on life's brevity and meaninglessness. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. If we could experience time the way Amelie does on the beach as a single, non-linear point, how would that affect the way we perceive the present? In a way, this is what Timefall does. It shows us how quickly and effectively so much of human civilization will be washed away by the natural, unstoppable forces of time. It's sobering to think about how brief humanity's existence has been and the non-existent influence we've had on a universe that is so incomprehensibly massive. Without giving a clear definition to whole or connection, Death Stranding does come across as idealistic, but it's also hopeful and sincere. In the face of inevitability, in a universe where order eventually surrenders to chaos, Death Stranding proposes that we drop our divisions, see the fragility of human civilization, and realize the strength of unity, of forging connections, is not just a nice thing to aspire to, but an endearing quality of our species. And that brings us to the end of the game. Sam is brought back from the beach precisely because of the connections he makes with people. After his rescue, Sam gets his final delivery, to take a now incapacitated Louise to an incinerator, as per UCA law. Sam shirks regulations, incinerating his handcuffs and resuscitating Louise. As Sam looks on, a rainbow appears, this time including the color blue. Being the color of death, blue is absent in Death Stranding's other rainbows, an effect of the Death Stranding, of life being out of balance when Amelie initially brought Sam back from death. But here, Sam restores balance, and all the colors of the rainbow reappear. And this is why Sam needed to live. As an extinction entity, Amelie couldn't stop her own destiny to end life on Earth. But by putting the pieces in place, someone could do it for her. And that was Sam, who, at the end, reconnected the United States and restored balance between life and death through his connection with Louise. Death Stranding looks into a universe, its future uncertain and chaotic, and says with conviction what Macbeth said with despair. That tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow is in your hands.